health in the European region. Um, it's my great pleasure and uh, uh, to invite uh, to welcome you all here today and uh, to express my thanks first of all to the UK Faculty of Public Health uh, and Maggie Ray for putting on this uh, seminar for us at very short notice, almost as short notice as the uh, panel of expert speakers that we have for you. But um, I'd like, uh, first of all, just to say that uh, we've got uh, nearly 400 people who've registered for this seminar from three continents, uh, more than 20 countries. And this subject that we're going to talk about today is clearly of vital interest to the UK, but it's also of concern and of interest uh, to countries in Europe, uh, but also beyond as well. Um, and I think um, we'll uh, have chance today to perhaps explore some of the wider uh, concerns that people have. Uh, you can uh, post in the Q and A uh, box on on the uh, Zoom screen if you have any questions for us or any comments, um, and uh, we'll uh, be uh, picking those up in a panel session uh, a little bit later on. But first of all, I'd like to go to uh, Maggie Ray uh, to give us uh, some introductory remarks from the Faculty of Public Health. Thank you, Maggie. Thank you very much, John. And uh, if I can also add my very warm welcome to everyone today to um, be with us on this really, really important subject and to thank the speakers also for giving up their time. We've got a great lineup of speakers. And John, it's a real pleasure to be working with you again. I was um, had the great privilege of working with John when he was president, I was his registrar for a few years and I have tried very hard in working with John to establish the faculty strategy that we would keep up the momentum on all the very good work that John led on and keep up the momentum to continue forward that, with that strategy. John, as you imagine, is a great source of advice and support to me in my present role. So. Again, thank you, John, for leading this work on behalf of the faculty. Um, I'm incredibly grateful to you. And I know that all of us here today will be very, very determined to keep all the relationships, partnerships that we've had, whatever the outcome of the coming months. And we will continue to keep this legacy that we've fought so hard to put in place and make sure that it's not lost in the midst of the um, very unfortunate circumstances we find ourselves in. So thank you so much, John, and a very warm welcome from me too. Back to you, John. Thank you. Right. Thank you, Maggie. Um, we're going to go straight into the proceedings now, and it's my great uh, pleasure to welcome uh, Professor Tamara Harvey. Hervey. Uh, sorry, and um, uh, Tamara is the um, John Monet uh, Professor of European Law from the University of Sheffield, um, and it's been my great uh, privilege to work with her over a number of years on uh, trade and public health. Um, and Tamara, the floor is yours. We look forward to hearing what you have to tell us. Thank you. Thank you very much indeed um, for inviting me to be with you here today. And thank you to Maggie and, uh, and the Faculty of Public Health in, in general. It has been a great privilege and um, a, a kind of bittersweet pleasure to be working with the Faculty of Public Health and to have done so since 2016, when um, a number of health organizations started to ask questions about how European Union law and trade law interact with health, which is a subject that uh, I've been studying for, for a number of years. So thank you very much for having me with you this afternoon. Um, and I'm, I'm, my job is to just set the scene and get us going, and in particular to focus on the legal, um, the legal implications and the legal environment. So let me just start with a few words. The European Union is a rules-based organization. Yes, the politics matters too, 
But in order to understand the European Union, you have to think about it in terms of the rules that bind it and its processes. The process of negotiating with the UK is taking place under the ordinary European Union rules for negotiating with third countries. Unlike the withdrawal agreement, where special and at that point untested processes applied, this is very much a standard negotiation for the European Union. The European Union is concerned, as usual, to secure a trade deal in its interest. The European Union is attentive to the history, the geography, and to existing patterns of trade. The UK is a large, proximate, and significant trade partner. Supply chains for many products involve the EU-UK border sometimes multiple times. Many services are also regularly supplied across that border. What are these rules and processes that I'm talking about? The Commission negotiates on behalf of the European Union on the basi basis of negotiating directives agreed by the Council. If agreement is reached, Council adopts a formal decision concluding the agreement. This decision has to have the consent of the European Parliament. All of these are formal legal steps that have to take place. That is why the timeline to deal or no deal is not a timeline to the 31st of December 2020, but to round about the end of October 2020. So far, there have been nine rounds of negotiations, and despite the rhetoric at the end of last week and over the weekend, negotiations are ongoing. We understand that key sticking points are fisheries, level playing field, and the governance of the agreement. It also seems to be the case that, unlike in a usual negotiation, the European Union has kept all parts of the agreement, the so-called chapters, open. This means that there is still room for give and take over these sticking points. For example, the Irish news channel RTE reported at the weekend that a possible way forward is to trade off access to the EU's energy market against the fisheries sticking point. It is in the interests of both sides to reach an agreement, but that does not mean that an agreement is the default. And so that means that the status quo is not the default position, something that I fear many ordinary people in the UK may sort of think be the case at present. On the contrary, the default is no trade agreement, and that would mean that the UK is treated by the European Union as a country with which it does not have a trade agreement, sometimes said to be the Australia option. This means that the EU and the UK imme imme would immediately impose tariffs at WTO rates onto goods crossing the EU-UK border, with associated increases in prices for some products and delays while electronic paperwork, also concerning regulatory standards, not just tariffs, is completed. In the short term, though, the arrangements would be even less than those between the EU and Australia, because although the EU does not have a single trade deal with Australia, it does have a number of sector specific agreements. In terms of the negotiation, if the UK does not take seriously the EU's rules and processes, there is a danger, I think, notwithstanding the intention and the desire on both sides to reach an agreement, that we will end up in a no deal scenario, almost by mistake. To this end, the European Commission, and especially proximate countries like France, are preparing for the ramifications of a possible no deal. The Commission is reviewing and where necessary updating the over 100 sector specific stakeholder preparedness notices that it published during the previous Brexit negotiations with the United Kingdom. What these preparedness notices do is to point out to economic operators, to firms that trade across the EU UK border, what the legal implications of no deal will be at this point. The conditions of access to the EU's market will be very different from the current position because the UK will no longer be part of the internal market, which it effectively is during transition, or the customs union or the VAT and excise duty area. 
We will hear more about the implications of No Deal for specific public health points as the webinar continues. But there are also implications for public health, even if an agreement is reached between the UK and the EU, at least as far as we know in terms of the negotiating text released so far by both sides. Both the European Union and the UK negotiating positions conceptualize public health matters quite narrowly. They think about public health as concerned basically with food safety, animal and plant health. The EU-UK trade, EU trade agreement will prevent the use of food safety, animal or plant health standards to protect domestic markets. It will require that both the UK and the EU base those kinds of standards on scientific assessments, but a similar obligation has not prevented disputes in the WTO context, for example, about genetically modified food. That is why the dispute resolution arrangements of the EU-UK agreement are important from a public health perspective. The EU and the UK will undertake to cooperate in relevant international fora, including through sharing public health information. This arrangement will reduce the ability of health stakeholders to hold the UK government to account because these fora are much less transparent than the EU and also because many of them, for example, the World Trade Organization, do not prioritize health. Setting aside Northern Ireland, which we may talk about a bit more later in the webinar, nothing in the EU-UK agreement will require the UK to align with the EU's food safety, animal or plant health standards, leaving the UK scope to adjust its public health regulation in the future. The European Union seeks control over safety standards for imported food. By contrast, the UK seeks equivalence recognition along the lines of the Canada, the EU-Canada agreement or the EU's draft text for an agreement with New Zealand on veterinary standards, which would reduce border controls and certification requirements. Of course, in this area of food safety standards, there is a major complication as it is likely to be very difficult to reconcile US demands for a future trade deal with the UK with the demands that the EU will want to impose with its trade deal with the UK. In the negotiating text that we've seen, there is no provision for cooperation on broader public health matters, such as tobacco regulation or communicable disease control. The implication is then that continued cooperation will take place only within the framework of the World Health Organization and other specialized agencies, where the UK's soft power as a relatively small state is likely to be diminished in comparison with its power as part of a common EU voice. On a domestic level, the UK government is also seeking to reduce the scope for Northern Ireland, Scotland or Wales to diverge from English public health standards for a range of products and services. This will be the effect in practice of the Internal Market Bill, if that bill is enacted as it currently stands. Because of the size of the English market, a requirement to permit goods to be sold in Northern Ireland, Scotland or Wales if they may so be sold in England, known as a country of origin principle in ordinary trade law, that country of origin principle enacted in the internal market bill will make it very difficult for Northern Ireland, Scotland or Wales to adopt more stringent regulatory standards something that certainly Scotland and Wales have said they intend to do on repatriation of such powers from the EU. And they want to do this in a range of areas like minimum tobacco pricing or food labeling, labeling for calorie information or advertising of food and alcohol, particularly in terms of aimed at young people. Although there is a standstill clause in the internal market bill, even existing rules like Scotland's minimum alcohol pricing rules could be at risk, according to Professor Kenneth Armstrong of the University of Cambridge. While EU law allows and EU law even requires public health concerns to be considered when rules restricting market access are issued, the internal market bill does not provide for this assessment. In fact, it's not even clear how the rules in the internal market bill will be able to be enforced or contested. So, to summarize, the legal implications for public health are in one sense the same as they have always been. 
Brexit is bad for health and Brexit has always been bad for health. In theory, there is a potential opportunity for the UK to take a regulatory path that secures better public health standards than as a member state of the EU. But in practice, that path to that better regulation is highly dubious, not least because health is not seen as a central element to trade negotiations and health expertise is not included as a matter of course. Although the UK government promised to do no harm to health post-Brexit, there is no legal accountability for that promise. Thank you. Thank you very much, uh, Tammy, for that uh, wide-ranging and uh, somewhat chilling uh, view of uh, where we are with uh, Brexit and uh, uh, trade deals. Um, and I'm sure uh, there's some themes there that the rest of our uh, team will uh, ex expand on as we as we go. Um, now then, my next guest, our next presenter is uh, uh, May Van Scholwick um, from the London School of Hygiene. May, have we got you still on, looking on the screen? Yes. Yeah, I'm here. Hello. Hi. Hi. Um, May is uh, uh, a senior research fellow in uh, London School of Hygiene. Um, and uh, has worked with the faculty on uh, uh, reports on in the BMJ last year on uh, the impact of uh, 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 Brexit on health and what we should be planning for. Uh, and now uh, I hand the floor to you, uh, May, to tell us about some of the public health implications. Over to you. Okay, well, thank you very much, John, and thank you for inviting me. It's a real honour to be able to take part in what is a, a really important webinar. Thank you for organising it, and thank you very much to the, the faculty for holding this. And thanks to Tammy for that really, really helpful overview of, um, of the legal implications. Um, I'll, I'll be using slides, um, and I'll... I'll um, I thought it'd bring something, something for you to look at while, while I talk through some uh, rather daunting... Um, Facts, but we'll, we'll see how we go. Um, so I'll actually I'll be um, touching on some of the wider um, implications of this next phase of, of Brexit, and and I'll be focusing on um, the public health perspective. And um, as John was saying, I'll be drawing from some of the work that Tammy, um, Tim, Maggie Ray, and and myself did with other colleagues at the end of last year, and we explored some of the potential direct and indirect health impacts of a no deal Brexit. Um, and we also, it was also a, it also, we sought to kind of use it as a call for health um, a, to, feed, to continue to feature um, on the Brexit debate, because as Tammy was saying, post the referendum, health did, to, did tend to fall off the Brexit agenda. Um, and I think it's, it's as, as Tammy was saying, it's also really important to emphasize um, that Brexit in any form is a, a period of major social um, change and transition. And has and will continue to have major impacts on people's lives and the wider determinants of health. And also during this time, public health has a role in keeping health on the agenda at times of transition and at the heart of policy debates um, and, and implementations. Um, next, next slide, please. I'd also like to, to um, as, as we did last year, emphasize that we're all working in a context of great uncertainty. Um, and obviously this is even more so in the context of the pandemic. It's challenging given that policy can change literally from day to day now and as does the information available. And this has implications for our ability to plan, but also for people's mental health and well-being and, and their sources of support and resilience during, during this time of transition. Uh, next slide, please, Matt. So in undertaking our work, we actually looked at a number of areas that were likely to be impacted upon by a no deal Brexit. And what I'd like to also highlight is that Public Health Wales conducted a very comprehensive um, health impact assessment of Brexit also, which, which is a great resource. Um, and there were also two assessments done, but prior to, to COVID on the um, specific impacts um, of Brexit on the NHS. And they're, they're publicly available through, through the Lancet. 
And I'd also like to emphasize that a no deal does not just relate to the situation that would apply, for example, from the 1st of January onwards, but also to the shock of a kind of rapid transition in which many things happen at once with largely unpredictable consequences that could, if negotiations had succeeded, had, had been avoided. I'd also like to emphasize that, as Tammy was alluding to, is that analysis show that a poor or a weak deal is also only marginally better than a no deal, um, and with similar risks for, for far sweeping negative impacts on the economy. So that the details of the deal, if there's a deal, also matter, matter very much. Um, but a no deal is likely to impact in multiple ways. Um, and th for example, through, as you can see in the figure, th for example, through um, disruptions to the trade system, but also the economy, um, a loss of institutional membership, as well as impacts on the health and social care and food systems. And there's also all of this and, and other, other impacts. There is a risk of that this leads to um, civil unrest, for example, in Northern Ireland or due to food or other shortages. And all of these together um, act synergistically to have direct and indirect implications um, for public health in the short, medium and, and longer term. Uh, next slide, please. Um, what I wanted to emphasize, though, is that it's important to realize the different context in which we are now working. And what we saw at that time as potentially new problems arising as a consequence of no deal are now current problems. Next slide, please. So obviously we're now working in the context of the COVID-19 pandemic, um, which has already had profound impacts on the economy, the health and social care systems. We've seen our food system have to at times um, apply rations to certain items. And we also see businesses concerned for their future viability and thousands have lost their job or, or actually fear for their jobs. Uh, next slide, please. So we're now faced with this likely dual challenge of managing both the pandemic as well as preparing for and navigating um, a no deal Brexit. Next slide, please. So I'd like to return now to some of the impacts um, that I was alluding to. Um, and at a local level, it's critical to think about what a no deal may mean for our communities. So a no deal, as, as Tammy was outlining, and I'll just briefly touch on again here, means that Great Britain is no longer part of the single market or the customs union. So as of, and that will apply as of the 1st of January, 2021. Um, but however, in, contra in contrast, in many respects, Northern Ireland will remain in both. Um, so trading with the EU, as well as other countries for whom we've not actually established a trade deal with, would then fall back on the WTO rules, as we've, as we've heard. And this would lead to, um, and imports would then be subject to import tariffs, and that's as set out in what's called the UK Global Tariff Schedule. And the cost of these tariffs and delays at the borders, um, due to um, new customs checks are likely to affect most sectors of the economy, um, with delays and price increases experienced by consumers, and some businesses may actually fold as a result of this. Um, and it's important to emphasize um, that actually recent government figures reveal that most businesses are not prepared for a no deal. And that's really important. So this has implications for people's livelihoods, um, which is a central concern for, for public health, obviously. Um, and for example, food chains will be affected. And Tim's gonna go into that in a lot more detail. Um, but just to say from a public health point of view, it's essential to consider how, for example, price increases on food or potential job losses in the agricultural sector will impact on the most deprived in our communities. And what type of knock-on effects are we having to consider? Uh, for example, uh, do people forego heating um, um, and then to actually buy food, um, poor diets and housing conditions may lead to more illness at a time when the health system is, is seriously overwhelmed from COVID. Um, and then this actually brings me on to, I'd like to talk now about, about what this might mean, mean for medicines. Um, so while there's much focus on, um, on, on natural supply chains, 
um, what, what, what we need to consider about, and, and this, this will have implications for the transport of medicines across borders, um, is that there's something else we need to consider, and that's, that's regulatory alignment is, is also an issue. Um, so no deal likely means that a deal on mutual recognition on good manufacturing practice and batch testing is not in place. Um, and this is resulting in additional checks on medicines moving across the border. Uh, with possible delays for up to 46 weeks, uh, four to, sorry, four to six weeks um, as medicines are, are, are retested. And the medicines and healthcare products, um, uh, products regulatory agency, so the MHRA, will assume responsibility for all medicines, um, uh, for the, sorry, for the regulation of all medicines in New Kent from the 1st of January. And although they've published guidance um, in relation to this to the post transition period, there's also been some concerns raised that many much more detail is needed to actually support industry to, to be implementing um, these regulation um, the, the new regulations just because of the, the, the inherent complex nature um, of, of, of medicines regulation. Um, just wanted to mention that it's slightly different. I'm not referring particularly to, to, to the impacts on, of the arrangements in Northern Ireland. And of course, um, under these conditions, under the situation, most things are largely, were largely settled in the withdrawal agreement. Although we've, we've seen kind of recent indications of, of um, a willingness to, to breach with some of the, the agreement. Um, and however, if, if we did uphold the, the if, if the UK did uphold the, the withdrawal agreement, it's likely that much of the food and medicines um, sold in Northern Ireland uh, will come from, come from Ireland. Um, and, um, Sorry, I'm just getting a message about my slides. I hope everyone can see them. Um, but the situation is, is especially um, unclear and we're still to see guidance for what actually all this, all this means, particularly in the, in the context of, of Northern Ireland. Okay, um, ne next slide, please. Okay, so on the, on the issue of, of, of guidelines, um, importantly, there actually are guidelines uh, that have been um, written and are directed um, for those providing health and social care. And I'm sure maybe many of you on this call have actually seen these and been working with these for a while. Um, but the guidelines available um, are directed, for example, at local authorities and the NHS um, on how to prepare for the end of, at, at the um, end of the transition period and entering into that new phase in, in January. And among other aspects, it really stresses the importance of coordinating with um, local resilience forum um, and importantly to have business continuity plans in place that are regularly updated, rehearsed and aligned with the planning of the local resilience forum. However, I think it's important now to there, there is a real concern um, whether organisations like NHS hospitals and local authorities actually have the capacity to be undertaking all this prep, prep, preparation um, in, in addition to actually handling the pandemic. So and also recognising that local resilience forums have already been working tirelessly um, in their efforts to address address the pandemic. Um, but flipping this the other way, I think it's really critical to consider how the learning and the experience of having to prioritise and actually working together um, in the context of the pandemic can be harnessed further to prepare for potential impacts of a no deal and how the actions that we're doing now can then weave in with considerations of what we need to do to prepare um, and, and in addition to what we're already doing for COVID-19. So while there's a lot to consider, I think a key issue here is about joint working across multiple sectors, um, which is going to be key in addressing um, any impacts of no deal Brexit as it continues to be in, in the pandemic. Uh, next, next slide, please. Um, so, I mean, I've, we're covering a lot and, and we're going through this quickly and we've got lots of opportunities to talk a bit more uh, during the discussion, but what I wanted to do is, is actually conclude by drawing some attention to, to a few issues that often uh, go overlooked, but are, are really critical um, at all times, um, but particularly during, during times of crisis. And, and these are public morale. Um, which is in, intricately linked to mental health and well-being, as well as the importance of community engagement and involvement. Um, 
literature on World War One or World War Two, for example, and, and other events, um, that maintaining pub, uh, public morale is, is, is extremely important and, and is key to, to any actions that we take. Um, and is also, it, we have to remember, it's likely to be affected and, and worsening in, in the current situation with an unraveling of our control of viral spread, um, prospects of future lockdowns and disruptions to even events like, like Christmas. So, for example, even the most recent flu pandemic preparedness plan recognizes this. And, and I quote, um, large public gatherings and quote and crowded events where people may be in close proximity are an important indicator of normality and may help maintain public morale during a pandemic. Um, but of course, you know, the current situation in, 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 in that we're facing now, not, this isn't possible and we need to consider, consider the implications of that. Uh, next slide, please. So hand in hand with that is the importance of transparent and clear communication. And this is pivotal to maintaining public trust and morale. Um, and I think local authorities and public health teams are very important sources of information for their local communities, as well as other partners, for example, such as the healthcare sector and emergency services. And, and it, this is even more important because given in the current situation, we're seeing that most recent surveys are showing that less than half of, of British citizens actually now trust the government as a source of information for the pandemic. And we, we need to be um, considering the implications of, of that and, and the implications of breakdown in trust. Um, I also think that the public health community has a very important role in continuing to document a lot of the adverse effects um, of Brexit and, and over time. Um, and this aligns with, with our, our, our duty to undertake health impact assessments. Um, and also thinking about how we really maintain those bridges and um, close working relationships, um, for, for example, through the faculty um, with, with other European institutions. Um, we, we're really fortunate because we, we've got a lot of people um, and fellows of, of, of the faculty, such as Martin McKee, Joseph Fotogreras, Mike Catchpole, Walter, Walter Ricciardi, as well as Natasha Azapati Muska, who are heavily involved through, for example, in the European Commission, the ECDC, and, and, other, and, and actually as senior officials in other governments. So maintaining those relationships will be key. And we've seen, you know, in, in the pandemic that, that working together is, is, is essential. Uh, next, next slide, please. And I just wanted to finish by saying that another key consideration is that recently the WHO has really stressed the importance of community participation in fighting the pandemic. Um, and I think this is going to be absolutely key as well to preparing for and navigating a, a no deal Brexit. Um, you know, our communities, they need to be at the heart of what we're planning and what we're doing, because ultimately it's their lives and their health that will be affected in the short and the long term. And then at the same time, we're asking a lot of people, um, uh, individuals and communities to, to make huge sacrifices in supporting the public health response to the pandemic. Um, thank you. <laughs> and I'll, I'll now pass over to, to Tim. Before, before you do, uh, May, thank you for that uh, uh, wide ranging presentation and some of the things that we should be concerned about. Can I invite people in the audience to post your questions as we go, uh, please, in the question and answer box, uh, because, uh, um, you know, we will have an extensive period of uh, uh, dealing with those questions. I've got uh, in the panel we have uh, Professor Saunders who's uh, uh, busily trying to uh, uh, assemble questions from, from you, the audience. He hasn't got much to do at the moment, um, but uh, we would like to assemble those uh, questions and comments that you have uh, and do it as we go along because then you'll uh, keep all our uh, uh, speakers thoughts in your in your uh, conscious um i should also say that um two of the questions we have had are about the uh, slides being available and yes they will be along with uh, tammy's uh, sp speech 
um, via a, a faculty uh, link when we uh, work it out at the end of the end of the uh, workshop. Okay, so thank you for that, and thanks, May. Uh, can we go then now to Tim Lang, who I'm sure is well known to many of you. Um, Tim's going to talk uh, principally, I think, about the uh, food implications of a uh, No Deal Brexit. Um, Tim, over to you. Thanks very much, John, and thanks to the faculty and, and, and everyone. This is so good. I mean, it's terrible that we're having to do it, but it's so good that it's being done. Um, uh, Mag, I don't know whether you've got my slides up or available yet. I will have in just a second. You will have them in just a second. Um, I, I have done slides, by the way, because uh, and I'm sort of feeling unusually smug that I did because we've had four questions saying, are they going to be available? The answer is I did them so that they are available. Um, I'm, I'm really going to try to flesh out some of the uh, big thoughts that both uh, May and um, Tam have given, um, but by focusing on food, which is what I work on, but essentially the situation is pretty simple actually. We haven't got uh, very much of a clue about exactly what the emergency food planning is for January the 1st. Uh, but we've come through, if you like, a dummy run of uh, COVID-19, which exposed lots of tensions which are very serious for public health. So I want to explore those. Uh, I don't know whether you've got them up yet, Mag, uh, but what I've done is I've split my talk into the immediate problems and longer term problems, because I think we, we kind of need to distinguish between those, but precisely for what May has been saying, um, uh, we have to uh, uh, treat them as two sides of the same coin, really. I've a, a sorry, uh, Tim. I've got a, par, a PDF document. Okay. Is that right? Fine. Yeah, it's fine. Yeah. Uh, or I can share them from my screen, whichever is easier. It might be easier to share them from your screen if you like. Yeah. Shall I do that? Oops. Long share. Oh. Yes, can I do that? Okay. Uh, let me see. Can you see that? Can you see that? Yep. 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 Okay. Okay. Let's go. Um, let's start with the short term first. This is food. Okay. So let's talk about not just general public health, but food flows. Why does it matter? Well, we're a just-in-time food system. I think many people now know that. They didn't know it until quite recently, but people like me have known that, and that's what the food industry is invested in for all the reasons that uh, Tamara was very elegantly showing, the, the emergence of the single market and so on, which of course the British were major pushers of, but now have walked away from. Uh, I think from the, the critical issue I wanted to ask first was, um, you know, what's the likelihood of real crisis, real crisis? Um, well, the, a full-blown emergency is possible. Uh, the government is posturing. I think at the moment it says that the EU is posturing. That's what sometimes happens. Uh, Tamara and I know people have watched trade talks. They take years and there's a lot of jostling that goes on. But the critical thing that we already know is there's little or no civic preparation in Britain. Little or no. <clears throat> in Sweden, for example, in the last two years, the government has given advice to consumers to have domestic stockpiles, basically. If there was a real crisis, as we saw at the beginning of COVID-19, when the government closed down hospitality and basically sent everyone to the supermarkets, supermarkets couldn't cope because just-in-time systems can't cope with extra rushes. That's the whole basis of them. Uh, so there's not been any civic preparation. The last point that uh, May was giving about public morale. Does this matter? Yes, it matters a lot. Um, and I think it, my point is, I think it matters even if there's a more old, orderly no deal or a more orderly agreement. We're still in this situation. Uh, uh, I completely agree with May. Food isn't just about nutrients, it's about minds. Uh, it's uh, and, and not just about markets, it's about public morale. 
Um, we know already from surveys that groups like which the Consumers Association as well as have been doing, uh, there is great unease, great unhappiness right across the social classes, right across income groups, right across uh, age demographics. Um, the worst case is obviously a run on shops, panic disorder, shortages. Uh, we could have, have in place, and I would argue we should have had in place Swedish style advice. Um, we could, and uh, colleagues and I wrote an open letter to the Prime Minister and to the Secretary of State for the Environment, Food, Rural Affairs Ministry, and the Head of Public Health England, dare I say, um, uh, back at the beginning of COVID-19 to say the hospitality sector should have been repurposed, should have been turned into community stockpiling, community uh, feeding systems and so on. Um, it wasn't and it still isn't. And instead what we've had is a classic British response, which is charity, voluntary sector, which itself couldn't cope. Uh, actually what is needed is orderly distribution according to health and need. Um, the ideal versus reality is something I find myself with colleagues talking a lot about and, and studying. Um, I, and I should declare an interest, I'm on the London Food Board for London, which is the biggest city in Europe. So here we are, eight and a half million people, uh, where frankly, we haven't got a good system in play. Um, what actually is needed, and we did do work as on the Food Board with the Resilience Forum for London, London Resilience, which was getting going when uh, COVID-19 hit. Uh, what one really needs to have an integrated coherent system of the state plus private plus civil society. Actually, what Britain ended up doing in COVID-19 was giving it all to nine companies. As one very senior person in the food industry said to me, um, it's going to take a lot to roll back and alter that power that's been given to nine companies. Um, market corrections are needed. We know that, as May referred to from war experience. Uh, we know that you need things like, if not actual rationing, uh, which I think is what we have to do in extremis. You certainly need to have a health template on what's available and what priority is given to in, in redesigning food supply chains. I'm talking about emergencies. What actually happened was, as I put in this slide, power to nine retailers, hospitality was closed, but we saw immediately how when belatedly after much pressure and lobbying, great credit to the Food Foundation and set up by Conservative MP, let me say, and um, sustain, uh, they showed that actually the need in the population was more like 8 million people. Um, and in fact, if you go and look at, I noticed May going to government official advice, if you go and look at the government official advice on preparing for emergencies, the onus is all on you preparing for it not it doing anything, not it facilitating, but it's up to you to look after yourself. Now for us in public health, that's a very bad place to start off with. It's a collective problem, not a Tim Lang problem. Um, and better than that, we actually had a law put in place in 2004, the Civil Contingencies Act 2004, which is what set up resilience forums, by the way, which insisted that there were annual reviews of food as a basic infrastructure and emergency crisis um, need. And if you go and look at the uh, official reports and reviews of that, it's complacency in the extreme. It just basically says everything's fine, everything will be okay, don't worry yourself. So you've got this real paradox of uh, Majesty's government putting the onus on you to prepare for emergency, but the Civil Contingencies Act saying um, uh, don't really worry about it, it'll all be okay. Uh, why does it matter specifically in food? Um, these are the six reasons it matters. If you have 30 seconds with your director of public health or your regional head of whatever you're in, these are the arguments that I would give. There's a long lead time system in food, even within just in time. The very minimum contract for food is six months, They're very often one year. The most important issues is do you pay in dollars, euros, pounds or what? Um, the second is that actually Britain is heavily reliant upon EU food supplies. So most of the food supplies that Britain gets in come through Europe, through, through Dover or Folkestone, through the tunnel or through boats into Dover. 
Um, the key issue in food matters is the, the key foods for health are disrupted. It's fruit and veg and ambient foods, which are most at risk, most perishable, but actually the ones that come through in huge quantities um, through Dover and Folkestone. Um, there is weak emergency food planning. I uh, struggle very hard and Gary McFarlane, who's on this meeting from Northern Ireland, um, uh, Chartered Institute of Environmental Health, we and others worked very hard to try and get resilience forums to take food as a priority issue in preparing for no deal Brexit from two years ago. I have to say privately in this meeting, I don't think we were very successful, but yet, as again, I say at risk groups are particularly vulnerable. They showed they were badly served, but the key issue was the reliance on the voluntary sector when the voluntary sector neither has the money nor the power to do very much about it. Um, in practice, this is what happens, this is what people like Gary McFarlane and his colleagues have to deal with. We now know from preparation, we know from uh, cabinet documents which were leaked and we've known right up to date, uh, the delays of now up to 7,000 lorries within two days are expected. Uh, and that uh, sanitary provisions are having to be provided on the M20. That's the minister saying it just this last week. Uh, we know, I've tried to put references here so you can follow it up if you want to, that there is pretty quick disruption to just-in-time systems and they're all IT dependent. There are many, many uh, security people I mean, military security people who are deeply worried about the IT dependency of the food system. And I think we in public have to have to, have, have to note that. We know that price rises follow and will hit the low income consumer bodies particularly. And we know, and I quote here, um, Andrew Opie of the British Retail Consortium, both at the top of this slide, we should look forward to a disorderly January. He didn't mean we should look forward to it, but it means we will look forward to that um, uh, if uh, no deal Brexit is pushed through. But you look at the bottom quote I put, if we see border disrupted in January, then we're going to have a big problem because then we won't have the food in the country to move around. What they learned, the food industry learned, the retail sector learned in the huge reorganization it had to do, the nine companies that dominate food supply in Britain, was they were able to do it because it happened at a time when there was a lot of food coming in, already in. That won't be the case in January, is the point that the food industry tell us. And this in graphic form is actually what's happening. We've got the EXO, uh, Exit Operations Committee, EXO Committee and Cabinet Speak, had a report given to it by the Border and Protocol Delivery Group uh, quite recently. It was leaked actually, which is quite useful on this occasion. We know all these sort of things are going to happen. We know the government's admitting in today's Financial Times, 50,000 new customs people are going to have to be employed to help at least half of British industry that still isn't prepared to get their customs clearance papers, a entirely new registration system is going to be needed. That's assuming everything works well, there'll be 50,000 new jobs, you could say what a good thing that is. Um, but already we're seeing, and there's a, an aerial photograph of one of 10 lorry parks in preparation, I've given references there. And we know, as I say, uh, the Minister of, of the Department of Transport is recognising that lorry drivers need to uh, we and go to the toilet. Uh, so there's good planning going for that. And that's something to be really grateful for. Um, for people like me, the critical issue is tariffs. If we do do a crash out, the government is calling this euphemistically the Australia option. It makes me laugh, actually. Um, it's WTO terms. Uh, the average Import tariffs will rise by 20, 22%. The estimates are, I've given some examples of fresh fruit and the bottom three onions, tomatoes and peppers are actually the biggest imports of perishable goods according to the Agriculture, Horticulture and Development Board. Um, um, but one of the things that may not worry you, but it certainly worries policy analysts like me, the exports of British food, we basically import uh, food which is good for health and we mostly export, well I won't say what's bad for health, but um, certainly things that the world and Europe has got plenty of, cheese and meat, but there's a 
really big crisis looming for farming and Britain's production. And if you note, actually, let me say something nice about tariffs. Um, Scotch whisky exports have dropped by 30% since Donald Trump put the 25% tariff uh, exactly a year on. So what the reality is, I put in red at the bottom here, it's more paperwork, but not taking back control. I've said all of this, or most of this, what lies ahead in extremists is border controls. If you just get two minutes extra um, uh, at Dover or Folkestone, uh, tailbacks build up within two days. Uh, just in time supply chains can't cope. They, they're very good. They depend upon satellites. Um, they're easily disrupted, by the way, or disruptable. Um, but the medium term problem we've already seen this year in Britain is horticulture is dependent upon um, European labour and they're already beginning to and have gone. And the government's still not put in place a new system for dealing with uh, the labour problem. Food is a labour issue. It's the biggest employer in Britain. 4.1 million people work in food. And I'll leave to Gary to talk about Northern Ireland, but he and I and others have written a couple of papers about that. Um, essentially, there's a huge import-export uh, dependency for Northern Ireland, a lot of it going through Holyhead, which looks like it's going to be uh, a new border control place. And um, uh, Tamara very elegantly raised the issue of food standards. We know all of these things have happened. And for those who know my work, uh, with colleagues um, Terry Marston and particularly Eric Milston at Sussex, we've done a lot of work on trying to compare and contrast the standards of you know chlorinated chicken and hormones and things. Indeed, it was our work which raised that. That got into the public um, uh, sort of consciousness actually, which is good, but the government has ignored it and has refused to put uh, maintaining high public health standards into law last week, I'm sure you noticed. Now, the longer view, I'll go very quickly but I do want to flag it. We do need to be dealing with the long-term issues of food and health. Uh, Brexit was mostly about what was disliked, not uh, what, what do we want to put in its place. A bit of that is beginning to emerge, but we still don't have a full comprehensive policy package in place. Legislation is in train, and I've listed the ones here which matter. The agriculture bill is England only, so Wales and Scotland are having to watch that very carefully. The House of Commons rejected enshrining high standards in law. The agriculture bill is basically about subsidies, shifting from the three and a half million pounds going to uh, essentially pay for property ownership of land towards environmental standards for ecosystems support. That is a good thing, but food has been dropped out of it. The agriculture bill is not about food, it's about subsidies plus environment. To deal with this gap raised by people who are on this call um, and pressure from the National Farmers Union, which I confess I encourage very hard to do that lobbying. The government set up a trade and agriculture commission on standards, but it's only one year temporary, has no public health people on it, no environmental specialists on it, no animal welfare specialists, no one from the consumer movement. And so it's re receiving opprobrium, frankly, is it really fit for this very delicate issue of food standards? I think the answer is no. The environment bill is still pending. The internal market bill that Tamara again rightly referred to, I really do want to assert stronger than she did. I think this is really dangerous stuff because it's asserting England's needs over Wales, Scotland and Northern Ireland. And those tensions I think are bad news for public health. But waiting in the wings, I haven't called it a bill, but our trade deals, these are the elephant in the room. And we're already seeing actually very interesting policy dynamics emerging in Trump versus Biden, the American election over Northern Ireland and Republic border. And the Democrats have made it very clear, literally they will uh, look askance and not do a deal with Britain uh, on agriculture or anything uh, unless the peace deal remains in place. Now, I have to remind us that this lack of coherent policy actually began to be fixed after the commodity crisis of 2007-8. And an entire policy development process went on for three years, culminating in 2010 with a program called Food 2030, right across government, health, agriculture, environment, you name it, consumers, all on board, cabinet reports signed off by the prime minister, 
and it was abolished in 2010 by the new government. And the reason I say that is because you will hear the National Food Strategy, which I want to go on to, which is uh, uh, being offered by the government, uh, which is an English National Food Strategy. It's often said this is the first review since for 75 years. It's not true. It's actually picking up on wasted 10 years after all of this work was done. But we are where we are. Uh, an interesting first part report of National Food Strategy was published in June. I've got the reference there. It did recognize health problems. It's very good news for that. But it recommended extension of school meals, poverty alleviation things. All of its recommendations have been rejected. Uh, so we're slightly nervous about are its recommendations for the part two, the really big report, which is due in the new year, what really is it going to be able to do? If the framework has been set by the agriculture bill plus the environment bill plus trade bills, et cetera, trade deals, uh, really what will the national food strategy be able to do? That said, as anyone who knows me, I'm an optimist. I hope for good things, but I'm not holding my breath. You have to be reminded by me as a public health person that all of these warnings were given. Uh, the really big lesson we must say for public health as a movement is the warnings have been there, but we didn't get any leverage. I'm not gonna go through these because I've kind of said them. Uh, we're going to drop out into Codex Alimentarius being what sets our food standards. It's the lowest common denominator. It's less control. Uh, for at least 30 years, John Middleton and I met over this sort of work in when the GATT was going through the General Agreement on Tariffs and Trade in 1987 to 1994. Um, and I, I led a team that looked at the membership of Codex Alimentarius. It was essentially big business setting food standards at the very lowest level. Uh, so Britain, and from a public health point of view, we've got very serious work to do about public health and food standards. I think there's a real problem of vision. I don't want to go into this. I've written about this in great length at my book, which came out uh, the week of the lockdown feeding Britain. Essentially, some very big policy choices are still not being resolved. What does Britain want from its food? Does it want to be fed by America? Is it globalist? Does it want to sort of neo-colonial to get, you know, Africa to feed it? Does it want out, want Libya or Egypt uh, or Israel, uh, Morocco to feed it, but not Spain or Greece? Um, uh, does it want to be a bioregional to produce more itself? Uh, these are big choices that take public health back to its roots, actually, which is the, the relationship between human bodies, land and labor. And as an illustration of that grand level thinking, just look at Britain's landmass. Here it is in one slide. Britain has 18 and, a th and three quarter million hectares of land. Croppable is about a third of that, six million in blue. Horticulture is exactly 165,000 hectares, nothing. We import all the good things, sorry, almost all the good things that we in public health say uh, we need for good health. We're not using our land, we're using our land to feed animals and then us saying we need to produce less of them. There is a real distortion problem there over health and ecosystems over land and human health. We need dramatically to increase our horticultural production, not at all costs, but only in an ecologically viable way. This is a really critical issue for public health. In one slide here, from a really magnificent pioneering set of studies. And the Committee on Climate Change, by the way, is beginning to get into this territory now. But this is a project called Zero Carbon Britain, trying to address what would Britain look like if it uh, was zero carbon. Um, on the left is Britain's landmass, that 80 million uh, hectares. Um, in orange ringed there, I hope it comes out as orange for you, is the, the, the amount of land that's used to feed us. Okay. Almost all of that is actually through, through animals, and, and we need to double that on the right if we really want to go uh, low carbon and reduce the amount for land 
for livestock. So the pink, if you notice, goes down. This is a very big restructuring. It's very hard for farmers, and I speak of the next farmer, very hard for farmers to address, but it's beginning to happen. Welsh farmers who voted to leave the European Union now realize 90% of Welsh lamb goes to France, for example. They're not gonna get it if there's a 40% tariff in the same amount. So there's a big period of restructuring and disruption coming. Okay, to conclude, uh, I think crisis planning, one of the things we're already learning, I listened to May on this and that nice study that I contributed to uh, her in the BMJ. Um, I think Brexit now is a case study. We need to see it as a case study of rich world peculiarities. We're seeing Britain's policies assumptions exposed that it will others will feed it. It's been Europe, 40% of food comes from Europe. Uh, and, and it's still assuming other people are going to feed it. Uh, uh, it. But it's a highly concentrated, economically concentrated food system. Food planning is weak. It's easily getting lost. But yet the population approach is essential. But we're being drawn into assuming that what's most important is just dealing with at-risk groups. I personally reject that. Clearly, at-risk groups are very, very important. But we don't get a proper answer to um, uh, the ecological public health unless we deal with the population at, at multi-level, international, national, local and domestic levels. What does this mean? And I speak as someone who is a policy lead on the Eat Lancet report, food in the Anthropocene, trying to address what needs to happen. One of the tragedies, if I may be personal, of Brexit is it's actually taken Britain's attention away from this. And now it's been very fragmented. I think here, if I had one minute with the minister, this is what I would give her or him. We've got to deal with these on the left by doing more of what we do on uh, what I've put in the black on the right. Um, you know, just to look at horticulture, if we really want to rebuild horticulture, we've got to retrain farmers, we've got to be thinking about preparing for food. I, I was born in Lincoln, uh, it's on a hill, uh, but uh, the, the, the fens are beneath the water. And, and I've spent weeks going through National Infrastructure Commission reports for my book, Feeding Britain, and there's nothing about food. Motorways being flooded, train lines being flooded, um, houses being flooded, but food, it somehow seems to, I laugh semi-hysterically, seems to have passed uh, their, their interest. But this is the body set up by the state to give 50-year planning. Uh, and we need to make sure they start taking this more seriously. Uh, so, uh, and civil awareness I put at the bottom. You can look at this later if you want to. Uh, what can the faculty do? I thought I would end with this for Maggie and colleagues. And I speak as a fellow of the faculty. We've got to do uh, what we're doing, what the seminar is doing, playing a full role in the debate. The faculty's food special interest group has really got going. There's an excellent paper that Kristin Bash at Leeds NHS led, which is really good. Uh, we've got to reinforce that local and regional dimension. I think we've got to push very hard for a public health approach to food strategy in the short term in the resilience forums. And I speak, I can say, as a member of the London Food Board, uh, we've only succeeded up to a point, if I'm frank, between these four virtual worlds. Um, and the long term, the point that Tamara said very elegantly about legal standards, it has to be in the National Food Strategy Part 2 or bust, is my view. And the, finally, I think the faculty, well, on this list, the faculty really is already supporting the Future British Standards Coalition, which is a very progressive uh, coalition, very large organisations. And I think if I had my 30 seconds extra with the minister, I would say we've got to promote sustainable diets as the basis for food policy at all levels. Uh, that's it. And if you want to see more, there's a huge more about uh, this and um, you know food defense issues through to ecological public health in my book, which is in the middle, which sold out in one week when the lockdown came, uh, but it's coming out in payback in the new year. Thank you very much indeed. That was a bit of a race through, but uh, I hope gave a flavor. I think we're in a difficulty and uh, well, we're in a difficulty. Great, thank you very much, Tim. And uh, uh, a huge amount there for us to be uh, uh, thinking about for sure. And uh, um, I'm gonna go to Gary now. Um, 
very short notice, Gary McFarlane from the uh, Chartered Institute of uh, uh, Environmental Health had kindly agreed to join us to cover some of those uh, issues that uh, environmental health officers are facing every day, whether it be in the ports or uh, as we saw there along the M20 perhaps. Uh, and of course, also the Northern Irish issues that uh, uh, of such major concern. So, um, Gary, are you there? Do come in. I am indeed, John. Can you hear me? Yes, indeed. Fire away. Okay. Um, Mike, are you going to work the slides for me? Uh -huh. I will, yes, Gary. Thank you very much. Thank you. Just bear with me a moment here to get myself organised. <clears throat> okay, um, John, thank you. Um, and thanks, Tim, for uh, uh, it's another, another fine mess you've got me into, is not what they said, for suggesting me for this, uh, as John said, at quite short notice, uh, but that's, that's fine. Um, uh, I am the director for the Chartered Institute of Environmental Health in Northern Ireland, although what I'm going to say today uh, will touch on environmental health issues right across the UK. Uh, but I will also uh, hopefully, uh, for many of you, I hope unpick and put across in a very practical way what the, some of the challenges for Northern Ireland actually are and why, more importantly, we've ended up with the kind of arrangements that the UK uh, have arranged with the European Union for Northern Ireland. Suffice to say, and I will explain it when I get to it, that Northern Ireland is no longer going to be the same, uh, and certainly in phytosanitary control terms, to the rest of the UK once we get to uh, January. Um, I suppose by way of background, uh, my background is environmental health. I spent over 20 years working in the service in a, 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 in a range of different areas. Um, and if you could just put up the next slide, please, uh, um, Mag, this is really a summary of the areas I'm going to touch on. Um, the brief was 15 minutes, so I am literally going to touch on some of these things, but look a little bit at, at standards, not just food standards, which Tim has talked a lot about, uh, but also consumer safety and environmental standards. Um, help you understand the practicalities of import and export. We've heard lots of discussion and commentary about the, the sort of uh, delays we're going to have, and I'm going to unpick that a little bit for you so you understand just what the implications of it actually are. Uh, talk a bit about crime and health protection. Um, but a little bit on food supply, which Tim has talked on. So the danger go last whenever you're preparing these things. Other people say things you you you, you may may, but I'll I'll keep it to a minimum. Uh, a little bit about dietary health and poverty, and some reflections and next step, steps to conclude. Uh, so if we can start off with the next slide, which injects a little bit of humour into this, uh, kind courtesy of Professor Patrick Wall, who I've known for a long number of years. Uh, and was formerly at the European Food Safety Authority. Um, and really the point of this slide is to, uh, albeit in a, in a, in a light-hearted way, uh, get across the fact, fact that we have got a, a system of standards and controls, not just in food, but in other areas of environmental health that are arguably the best in the world. And that has, that has come about because of our membership of the European Union. Um, I'll talk a little bit about food control or food standards and controls in a, in a moment, uh, just to illustrate this, but it, it's not just food. It's important to realize that our air quality standards, our drinking water standards, um, the controls on the use, for example, of pesticides, the safety of goods, for example, children's toys, electrical goods, uh, and furniture that you sit on in your homes um, being made with the right kind of component materials so that you don't have either fire risks from it or back in the day, uh, rather nasty chemicals emitted from it are all to do with European directives and European regulations. Now, once we leave the European Union, of course, uh, the UK will apply its own regulatory standards course 
Um, and we've already seen uh, 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 some of the debates around that, which I'll come back to in a moment. Um, and then it's probably appropriate at this point to talk a little bit about capacity, particularly in terms of inspection and regulation, which is the title of this slide after all. Um, local authorities and port health authorities are, are, are already under real pressure in terms of professional capacity, simply as a result of COVID. Um, but equally as concerning is what is coming over the hill, so to speak, in terms of transition. In other words, once we get to January 2021, um, the capacity issues are significant. And I will come back to that when I explain uh, import and export to you. Next slide, please, Max. Now, um, advocates for Brexit um, have argued that transitioning uh, the existing UK regulations, which, as I've said, are based on UK standards. And this is an example from food control. Um, it's an, the example I'm using here is called RASIF, which is the rapid alert system for food and feed. And the, the reason I'm putting this up, um, and that's just simply what's available. This is publicly available, by the way, but the, um, but the UK as part of the EU is linked into the enforcement uh, 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 side of this. In other words, the data that people don't get to see. Um, and what it basically does is that if there is a contravention of a food or feed law anywhere in Europe, all the country states are automatically notified. It's if you like a rapid alert. It's what it's, it does what it says on the tin. It's a rapid alert system. Um, and that obviously is critically important in terms of public health, uh, because whilst not all contraventions of food law uh, are, are of public health import, um, many of them are. Um, and the reason I'm, I'm using this as an example is it's disingenuous to suggest that all we need to do is transition EU, EU regulations into, into GB or into UK regulations. It's much more complex than that. Um, it's a whole interconnected system, an ecosystem, if you like, in terms of regulation and enforcement. And the same is true of other areas of um, environmental health. Uh, so, for example, there's similar systems uh, that exist with re in relation to, for example, the safety of consumer goods. So, um, at the minute, my understanding, I, I mean, it, this is all, of course, dependent on whether or not we have an agreement, whether we have we, we have a basis to trade, and what what can be negotiated. But it's an example of the interconnected nature of systems and how it's not just as simple as regulations. Next slide, please. Okay, these are. Uh, this is really just a backdrop to help me try and explain uh, imports and exports to you. And um, what the slide shows is the new health marks that are going to be used from January 2020 to 2021 on, on products of animal origin, POAO as they're known. And if you actually look at them closely, it gives you a clue as to the changes ahead in terms of what are called phytosanitary checks at border inspection posts or designated points of entry, as well as a clue to the differences that exist between Northern Ireland, or will exist rather, between Northern Ireland and the rest of the UK. And as you can see, uh, food businesses in Northern Ireland will use a different health mark than anywhere else in the UK or GB as it uh, is the technical term. So Great Britain, um, when you live and work in Northern Ireland, you have to be, uh, you have to be very uh, precise with your terms. So Great Britain, for the, purpose of, for the purposes of clarity and avoidance of any doubt, means England, Wales and Scotland, whereas the UK, of course, includes Northern Ireland as the fourth constituent part of the United Kingdom. And you can see from this that in essence, Northern Ireland will have different health marks. And of course, many of you will be aware, I'm quite sure, and anyone from Northern Ireland will be very, very aware <laughs> um, as to why come January 2021, Northern Ireland will effectively trade differently than the rest of the UK insofar as its relationship with Europe is concerned. 
And the easy way to explain this is that is to, is to uh, simply explain that Northern Ireland will essentially follow European regulations and rules as if it were a part of the EU. And well may people say, why is that the case? Um, and you, I don't think anyone will have escaped the debate that has raised for years now, in fact, ever since uh, the results of the referendum on the Irish border. Um, and the, the explanation to this and the reason why Northern Ireland will continue to follow uh, EU rules and regulations lie in the solutions and the potential solutions to the border conundrum. Um, the border issue in Ireland is key. The land border that is. We cannot have a return to a land border in Northern Ireland. And clearly if Northern Ireland were not to follow European, uh, uh, European standards and so on, then that would effectively de facto create a, uh, the, the land border as, as a new border checkpoint or a new border inspection post um, with all of the consequences that uh, that means, um, not least for uh, people who live and work, uh, live in one part of the, the, uh, the border and work in the other, uh, the huge volume of, of traffic that crosses that border on a daily basis, um, and of course, the historical implications of the, the, the border issue on the island of Ireland. In fact, um, the, the preservation of, of the freedom across that border is enshrined in the Good Friday Agreement, which is an international treaty. And that's why, in essence, another solution has had to be found. And the solution is um, the, the, the special arrangement. It is is that, what does that mean in practical terms? Well, what it means is, is that goods from Northern Ireland can continue to move into Europe as they always have done. Um, and we are assured into Great Britain. However, uh, goods coming into Northern Ireland from Great Britain will be subject to checks. Um, so they will be treated uh, as it were. As, uh, and the reason for that is because the seaports in Northern Ireland will de facto become European Union border inspection posts. Now that, the implications of that um, for businesses and trade in Northern Ireland have yet to be seen. Um, um, but they could be significant. Um, let me talk about explain export health certificates to you um, as, as one of the, uh, and, and let's unpick that a little bit because it'll give you a good understanding of why there is so much concern around the potential uh, impacts that, that these kind of controls will have. Never mind the fact as to whether they can actually be discharged and whether there's the capacity to do that, but how they will have a knock on impact in terms of delays. And Tim has talked about. Um, uh, the potential for delays at Dover, and uh, the, you know, just to repeat what he said, previous work uh, modelling has shown that just a two minute uh, um, addition to a task, the, the task of checking lorries at Dover could lead to significant delays down the motorway. Um, so export health certificates are a mechanism that are used currently uh, to export the you require an export health certificate to export either live animals or products of animal origin to countries outside the EU. And an export health certificate is simply, uh, if you like, an assurance mechanism to the country that's actually receiving those goods that those products meet the requirements in the destination country. Um, now, it is not uh, a, a simple sign forming exercise. It is a quality assurance mechanism. Um, and there is a fair degree of rigour to the process that has to be gone through. Now, every single, uh, let, let me give you an example here. Imagine that you are, uh, and I'll use, uh, uh, this is obviously not going to apply to the Irish land border because of the arrangements I've just explained and what has been put in place to, 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 to solve this particular problem. But this would apply to any product moving 
from the U from GB into Europe. And that can be into Ireland, remember, uh, uh, north or south, as well as across the channel into France. Um, from January, those all products of animal origin will require export health certificates in the absence of and a trade agreement. Um, now, if you are a sandwich manufacturer, simple example here, a sandwich manufacturer on the Northern Ireland border that supplies, let's say, 30 shops in Ireland with 10 different types of sandwich, i.e. 10 different fillings, um, six days a week. Every single product, that is every single filling, to every single destination requires an export health certificate. So that means uh, that's 300 export health certificates every day if the, 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 there, there were a border on the island of Ireland, uh, i.e. 1,800 export health certificates a week. And that's just an example of a very small manufacturer. So the issue of capacity at the ports, uh, or sorry, not capacity at the ports, the issue of capacity for export health certificates alone is of significant concern. Um, <clears throat> in terms of imports, um, once we reach the end of the transition period, then all goods that are coming from into GB from the EU will be subject to tariffs and other checks that the UK government may decide. Depending on what those are, um, um, that, that could be significant. And that leads me nicely to the next slide, please, Mike. Now, again, this is a slightly tongue in cheek uh, uh, slide um, that refers back to the horse uh, gate scandal, as it was called. Um, but on a more serious, uh, and, and, and you can you can you can make sense of that. I'm quite sure for yourself. But on a more uh, serious note, the next slide, please, Mike. It would be a big mistake. And this is this the, the, the important point here is that this sort of activity goes on even when we are part of the European Union uh, uh, standards and controls, which, as I said earlier on, is uh, arguably probably the best, uh, uh, certainly in food safety terms, is probably the best in the world. And yet we still have um, illegal activity that can many uh, is uh, that that can also of course put in potentially be a major public health uh, concern um so this this is an example that was i took from for, for a previous uh talk i was preparing for this um a little, little bit dated now um the 29th of january 2019 um but this still goes on i mean if you were to go back to the RASF details that i put up on a previous slide um, on the 29th of September of this year, for example, um, there, there was, uh, uh, sorry, I beg your pardon, on the 12th of uh, um, October of this year, uh, just a matter of days ago, there was, uh, there were donuts on the market with uh, undeclared ingredients, including egg, milk, soya and wheat. And you won't, none of you will need me to tell you of the potential significance of that for people uh, with allergens with those specific allergens. Um, now, that would not necessarily have been a deliberate food crime. The point I'm making at the one that on the slide that you see on the screen is there's very deliberate criminal activity that goes on in the whole area of food. Why? Because it's highly lucrative. It's highly lucrative financially for the criminals involved. Um, so we need to have a robust system of uh, standards and controls in place in the UK moving forward. Um, and, you know, we, we have heard in uh, just as recently as last week, the UK government still refused to make legal commitments to that, this, to, to maintaining those standards, despite the fact they've given those assurances. Next slide, please. A word on uh, food self-sufficiency, and Tim mentioned this. Um, uh, the most up-to-date figures that I can find on fresh fruit, for example, is 84%. Um, and as this slide demonstrates or illustrates, we are highly reliant on Europe uh, for uh, particularly our healthy foods, as Tim said, our fresh fruit and vegetables. Um, we could. Uh, 
Tim has alluded to some of the, some of the um, uh, figures in behind our current agricultural system and the way our food is produced. But uh, suffice to say, we were a long, long way away from uh, food self-sufficiency. Um, and in particular, um, we are particularly reliant on the EU and elsewhere for fruit and vegetables. And that is of some concern, I think, uh, in public health terms in the longer term. Next slide, please. So we need a more, much more sustainable food system. Um, and I suppose the, the, the encouraging thing about this particular slide for me is that actually uh, the public do care. They do care where the food comes from. Um, they do care about its provenance. Um, and I think in terms of some of the uh, suggestions that Tim was alluding to, in terms of need to, to uh, build a sustainable food system for this country, um, and these islands, indeed, I would argue, it's not just the UK. Ireland needs to be part of that consideration as well. Um, um, there, is, there is certainly a public interest in, uh, in, a, in, in the provenance uh, of our food. Next slide, please. Um, Tim also mentioned the Lancet report. Um, if you haven't looked at this, uh, I would really encourage you to do so. It's a, it's a really fascinating piece of work, albeit um, um, in some ways very daunting, but, but I, I think for me, it's positive. You know, it not only shows uh, a way in which, where we need to get to, but ways in which we can do it. Um, and there's a striking uh, correlation for me uh, from on the diagram on the left hand side, which is what a planetary health plate would look like. In other words, what our, our plate would look like in good planetary health terms uh, and what actually our dietary health plate should also look like. Um, it, so it, for me, that correlation is, is really, really striking. Um, I think that um, just just perhaps just to, to share with you, uh, uh, may, many people may have picked this up. Um, if anything positive has come from this current dreadful situation we find ourselves in with COVID, it's really interesting for me as as an EHO uh, to to reflect on the improvements that we've seen uh, in environmental terms in a relatively short period of time. Um, I read an article last week uh, that suggested that we'd already met the kind of carbon reductions this year that we would need to sustain moving forward to keep uh, uh, runaway climate change within within check and within limits, and we've managed to achieve that uh, through the through this uh, pandemic. But of course, we need to sustain that moving forward. So I'm just simply reflecting on the fact that you know the way in which some of uh, way in which we've changed the way we go about uh, living our lives and doing some things, particularly in the world of business, I think is something that we probably need to try and hold on to uh, moving forward. Next slide, please. Oh, that's the same one. Just, move, move, just next slide, please. So some closing reflections. Um, next one, please, Mike. Perhaps it's uh, <laughs> rather ironic that somebody from, from Northern Ireland would use a Titanic slide uh, to try and, and uh, make a serious point. Um, I've used this before in discussions and debates around uh, climate change, and it seems to me that it, it might well be appropriate to the current course we're on as well. Uh, and for me, the, the, the very salient poignant uh, points to make about this are that for anyone who studied the Titanic disaster um, and you know how it happened, you will know that the, the, the ship, the, the, the crew knew uh, uh, that there were icebergs around. They knew that there was an, a real danger. And actually then in, in, in terms of the actual iceberg that the ship hit, they saw the iceberg uh, clearly in front of them. But by the time they decided to try and take uh, um, avertive action, it was too late. They simply could not stop uh, that weight of a ship uh, in that short space of time or avoid the collision. 
Um, and of course, uh, just like the Titanic uh, disaster, it was, it, you know, if we, if we continue on our current course, certainly environmentally, uh, but also arguably, if we don't sort out some of these issues that we've got to deal with, it will be the most vulnerable and the most disadvantaged um, that will suffer most. Next slide, please. Um, and I, I got this several years ago, but I still think it's really, really poignant and salient, even now from the New Economics Foundation, a brilliant organization. It was from a report called Changing Progress. Um, and you can see the, the uh, statistic, if you like, at the end or, or the bottom of the slide. Um, other commentators have mentioned the uh, potential for uh, poverty increase, both not just in food terms, but in other uh, aspects of poverty as well. Tim mentioned the tariffs, the potential increase in the cost of not only food, but other commodities and the implications of that um, for uh, uh, the least well off in our society. I think that's um, another another salient reflection for me in terms of where uh, where we're potentially headed and some of the things we will need to do to avert that. So, final slide, please, Mike. Um, just some some suggested next steps from my perspective, um, and it seems to me that the faculty could work with us um, and indeed others on these issues. Um, we did begin uh, some dialogue earlier on in the summer around the whole area of food. Um, it's incumbent on me to follow that up. Uh, COVID has unfortunately sort of gotten away, but uh, we have to find the capacity and the time to revisit these issues. Um, I would say, and you might expect me to say, that standards must be maintained, not just food standards, but all the other standards I, I alluded to at the start um, in environmental terms as well. Um, we could perhaps jointly look at some sort of uh, uh, paper on food and public health. Um, and finally, I think that the climate change issues need to be, uh, need to be brought back to the fore as well. Um, I have long uh, argued that climate change is a public health issue. It's not an environmental issue. Um, and unfortunately, that's part of the reason why um, it's not. I don't think we haven't maybe made as much progress on it in terms of addressing uh, the issues as we might, but I think it needs a strong uh, or a reconnection with public health and um, a re-energised public health focus. Thank you very much. Thank you, Gary. Thank you. Um, now, um, we've uh, gone somewhat over time on what uh, we, we were going to present, but uh, Nevertheless, it has been an extraordinarily rich set of uh, presentations that we've had. So thank you to all of our presenters. Um, I'm now going to invite uh, Professor Pat Saunders to um, try and uh, tease out from the question and answer uh, box uh, the themes that people are asking about uh, and perhaps a few themes that uh, have come out in, in the presentations that aren't yet in the questions. So, Pat, over to you um, and throw the uh, questions thick and fast to our panel, if you would. OK, uh, thank you, John. Um, Tamara and Tim have said been very swatty and, and they've answered some of the questions, but I, I still think we benefit from a panel discussion. And I've, I've tried to group the questions together because some of them overlap. So we kick off with a very challenging question. One of our guests referred to a perfect storm of COVID, Brexit and, and January weather. And Gary referred to the, the consequences of the failure to avoid the collision with respect to the Titanic. So the question is, what should local authorities be doing now with 12 weeks to go with respect to preventing and or mitigating the impacts of a no-door Brexit, including civil unrest. I should say that the, the biggest number of people that we have on the uh, call today are actually local authority, uh, public health, environmental health, and other policy people. So it, it is a, 
key and uh, a very uh, practical question. Uh, I think I'll probably invite Gary to uh, to comment first. Yeah, I, I think I think one of the uh, one of the really uh, big issues for local authorities, and I did allude to it, um, is capacity um, and the and the lack of it. Um, now, uh, for local authority colleagues, um, we I, I, I and I'm I, there, there, you, you you will see more about this in the next in the next couple of weeks. We uh, are working. It's taken some time to get this over the line, but we are working with government now to try and provide um, support for local authorities in terms of identifying additional capacity that may exist out there. Um, it's in particular, it's 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 not just um, EHOs; it's other public health uh, expertise, particularly in health protection. Um, and to, to try and allow for uh, the redeployment, uh, you know, you, local authorities can potentially redeploy existing staff onto, on, into other areas if they can call upon uh, people that might be out there to backfill. Um, so we're going to be doing um, some quite significant work around that in the next couple of weeks. Uh, essentially, it's going to be the, the, the uh, hopefully uh, launch off and, and then population and maintenance of a national professional register. Um, and the basic idea will be to draw on um, colleagues who are perhaps working in the private sector in a private consultancy capacity with not much work to do in many cases uh, at the minute um, or have found themselves having been made redundant or perhaps uh, they are recently retired um, and would consider coming back um, or they are graduates who are maybe not yet fully uh, qualified but could be plugged in and brought up to speed or they could even be undergraduate students who could be deployed in a, a, a range of different roles. Um, and whilst that will um, include environmental health, it will also include other, uh, other professional areas of public health. So we will be working, I hope, with the faculty and others to try and um, uh, uh, populate that resource um, the LGA will be supporting that in terms of the platform. Um, so that's that we hope that that will help local authorities deal with some of the capacity issues they face. But it's really beyond that, it's a really good question. I mean, um, you know, so much of this hinges on what, uh, you know, and I'm, I'm ever the optimist, so much of this hinges on what can potentially still be negotiated. You know, and a lot of what I have suggested doesn't have to happen if we get the right agreements in place. Um, what local authorities can do to influence that, I'm not terribly sure they can do an awful lot. I think that's up to others to, to, to do. But I mean, um, I think we it's incumbent on us all as professionals to engage with our with our MPs and, and elected representatives on this because it's not too late to avert some of these very significant consequences. Okay, thank you. Uh, uh, May, do you want to comment on this one or? Yeah, sure. I, I mean, I think I think Gary's done a you know really great job in summarising some of the key challenges. And I think, as you say, it's 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 really challenging for for local authorities right now because of what they're having to do with the pandemic. But I think um, something that that kind of comes to mind is 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 a couple of things in in that. You know, public health can really emphasise how some of these impacts compromise then our ability to continue to um, effectively um, address the pandemic as well. So, you know, everything that was exposed early in the pandemic was people need access to food, they need a place um, to shelter, and potentially, as, as, as Gary and others were saying, and, you know, rising tariffs and then rising poverty is then exactly we go backwards. So I think, you know, the huge agenda for the UK and, and, and the government is that we're able to to actually address the pandemic. I think we can really stress then the links of if we don't, how it then undermines all that work. And we know that that's that's a huge issue. Um, and, and to also, I think sometimes that um, something I think doesn't get discussed enough is to, is to also really think about how a lot of what's happening 
is impacting significantly on those who have who I don't think often get a voice, which is our, our children, the youngest in society. So, you know, they've had school impacts. They, they a lot of, um, you know, we're concerned about things like holiday hunger. It, it's thinking about uh, the impacts this is actually having, having on, on the youngest in society as well. That's just something I, I do like to raise a bit. Thank you. Um, okay, should we move on to another question, Pat? Yeah, sure. Next question. What impact will a, a no deal Brexit have on our COVID response? Who'd like to that, ask that, answer that one? Uh, um, Tim? Um, uh, f forgive the cynical smiling. Um, basically, it'll exacerbate it. That's what uh, everything points to. Uh, it'll reinforce divisions and difficulties like the ones that May has just referred to, children, age groups, demographics, but income differentials. Uh, we've seen it already. I mean, look at it. You know, it's strong evidence that uh, obesity and big fat um, survival of COVID-19 in extremists. Um, it, there's a, a mutual reinforcement. I think one of the questions, Pat, and, and others, if you've seen it, the, the, sort of the multiple storm idea. Um, we're in it. That's why I was trying to say, I try to sit back and think about it. And I speak as someone whose only organization role really in this is London Food Board. You know, and we're the biggest city in, in Europe. And we haven't got a food plan. We haven't got legislation. We haven't got powers. We got the, I, I will now say this, I put it euphemistically in my book, but uh, we really struggle to get legal advice about what powers are there um, for a local structure to do anything to either intervene or at least mitigate the worst effects of, of, of a no-deal Brexit or a COVID-19. And in the end, we got the uh, City of London lawyers to advise us, and essentially it was just children's acts. So May's right, children actually are the legal way in. Uh, and only last week, when uh, you know a fairly obscure footballer uh, got f sort of four million uh, people to back him or whatever it was, you know, e even that sort of pulling power uh, couldn't get this government. And I have to say, it's this government to give duties to ensure that children would be fed over, you know, two week breakdowns or holidays or things like that, and. The National Food Strategy, Henry Dimbleby, in his part one report, recommended various things to try and address uh, the 8 million people the Food Foundation and others have estimated were not getting enough, and the government turned it down. So, you know, Gary is right. There's not much that we can do. Uh, but, oh, yes, there is. We go into different mode. We go into protest mode, actually. And let me remind ourselves, the public health movement has always been very good at numbers and counting bodies as they fall off a cliff and calling it epidemiology and preparing uh, better insights and prevention strategies. But part of that prevention strategy is to shout. It's to shout and to organise genially with people to make sure a, a, a better way of doing is at least on the table but we're not in a good place i don't think anyone on this call would think that we're in a good place we don't have our usual possibilities and when we had these big difficulties and of recessions and austerity in the 1980s we could go to the european union and say you know give us a different look on it now we've got no counter look with which to view uh, what's going on other than academia and science. So I think our role as scientists and academics is actually very important. We, we are now having to do more than we usually do, which is to be a mirror and hold it up to society and say, is this what you want? Is this what you voted for? Is this really, really what you want? And I thought you, you're getting a bit of that emerging in the messy politics that we've been witnessing in the last few days with Manchester and the Northwest kicking up and just saying, 
we're not going to accept it. And you notice suddenly it wasn't just Labour-Tory splits. Actually, it was really interesting and still is interesting. Very different dynamics occur. So I think there's, I'm, I'm, I'm not saying anything different to uh, anyone else other than just saying our playbook as public health includes things that we've not had to use very often. Shouting, holding witness, uh, speaking up, building alliances, organizing, local committees. You know? I think we're going into that terrain. Okay, thank you. Let's let's try another uh, question, uh, Pat. Let's see what. Okay, uh, um, Tamara's uh, at least partially answered this one, but uh, I've merged it with, with another one. But will, will the UK, even with an agreement, link the main link to the EP Centre, the European Centre for Community Disease Control, and DG Research? Uh, tell the Tell the world that one, uh, Tommy. Sorry, I didn't quite catch the question. Is it the one about um, links with the, with DG Research and yeah. DG Centre? And the European Centre for Communicable Disease Control. Okay, thank, thank you for the question. So as far as we can see from the negotiating text from both sides, there's no intention to continue to collaborate in the European Centre for Disease Control. Neither side seems to want that. Um, others can speak better than me in terms of the extent to which that matters. I've read at least one study that suggests that the granularity of the data that's shared in ECDC is better than shared just through ordinary WHO channels. In terms of the other kinds of collaboration, um, so collaboration on biomedical research, for instance, or collaboration in terms of sharing information about uh, that might be relevant to public health, this could be anything like um, migrating doctors uh, who have a, a perhaps a yellow card against their fitness to practice, which happens within EU law systems. The UK would very much like to be part of these things and, and quite a lot of these types of things are buried in the UK's negotiating text, have not been mentioned by the government, have not been picked up by the media. But from the EU's point of view, it is not possible for the UK to have access to those things because those are part of the, the European Union's internal market. And the UK has very clearly said that it does not want to be part of the disciplines of the internal market. So from the EU's point of view, if you do not want to be part of the disciplines of the internal market, you cannot have your cake and eat it. So I think, you know, much as the UK might have wanted some of these things and much as, you know, everybody in the sector, uh, everybody everywhere in the health sector who we talk to in our research from 2016 onwards says, please, can we have as close to the pre-Brexit position as possible? Everyone in the sector says that. And I think everyone in many economic sectors says that. That is not possible from the point of view of the position that the UK has taken in terms of the type of relationship it wants to have with the EU. Sorry to be bearer of more gloomy information. Thank you. Um, I think we've got time for one more of the themes that are coming out, Pat. Okay, in the interest of balance panel, are there any potential public health upsides to Brexit? Who would like to answer that? The smallest book in the world. Um, Tim, very uh, brief. I'll say the potential. Potential is that Britain could set really amazingly good food standards, could uh, reduce its animal production by 50%, could aim for a, a, a zero carbon um, food supply system, could shorten supply chains, could ensure that primary producers, whether they're fisher folk or um, growers, but particularly horticulturalists, got double the returns. At the moment, they only get about five, six, seven percent of the gross value added of the money that we spend. All the money is made off the land rather than on the land. All of that is potential. Are we going to get that? No, we're not. Um, for the reasons that I get interviewed all day long by people, uh, just been interviewed by one of the big media setups, suddenly realizing, oh my goodness, if we have American beef standards, beef will be cheap, it'll come in, 
but it won't be operated at the same time. It'll be CAFOs, CAFOs, um, concentrated animal feeding uh, operations. Um, so, but the potential to be uh, something much better is great. Does it look like we're going to get it? No, that's why I kept on saying in my talk, you know, the government rejected Marcus Rashford's recommendations. It rejected its own independent advisor on the national food strategy of wanting children to be fed in holidays and better food school standards. That's just school food, not just all food, just school food. Uh, but the potential is there. Uh, but will the public go for it? Will this government do it? No, I don't think so. Uh, but uh, in the government, and I know people in the government, and I talk with them, um, they think that we will get good standards on ecosystems. Uh, uh, and I think that is possible, uh, but it'll be happening by the loss of food production. So uh, almost certainly the, there's agreement now in the conservation mm -hmm. environment movement that uh, land use will be much more focused on ecosystems development and the food uh, function will dwindle. But could something be better, uh, a multi, what we call in my world, a multifunctional agriculture? Uh, yes, in theory, but is it looking likely? No. Okay, Th thank you for that, Tim. Um, I, and, and certainly that idea of, uh, uh, you know, the, the positives, the reclaiming of the words like what self-sufficiency being a good use of the word rather than a, uh, an isolationist view, but a, uh, a model and an exemplar for how uh, a country might uh, organize its natural resources and, uh, uh, its, and, and support its people, its farmers and so on. I think those are things which in the longer term, we, we certainly do need to argue for. Um, being where we are. Um, I've just got a couple of minutes to uh, uh, try and summarize briefly, and then I'm going to invite uh, Maggie Ray to have the very last word. Uh, and we do need to be off the call by uh, four o'clock so the uh, platform can go to another uh, faculty um, uh, webinar. But um, it seems to me, um, thank you to everybody for the very rich contributions that we've had. Um, and I think uh, for me, the uh, areas of uh, concern that we've got are those in the first 12 weeks, in this 12 weeks. Um, the short term stuff, it feels to me that uh, as somebody mentioned the local resilience partnerships uh, need to be asked what their planning is for uh, food shortage, uh, for potential uh, unrest. Uh, and they need to uh, be, be planning uh, for an immediate uh, period of uh, difficulty and shortage, as uh, Tim quoted Andrew Opie as saying, uh, even if we ain't going to starve on January the 1st, um, we've seen how chaotic uh, some panic buying can be. Uh, and um, we, we've no reason to believe that people will behave differently uh, once uh, we achieve the uh, crash out Brexit, if that's where indeed we get to. Um, it does seem to me also that uh, uh, there's a need to mobilise locally. And, and again, some local authorities have been extremely successful working with uh, community organisations, local organisations, mobilising the, the mutual aid and the uh, uh, trying to, to have local food uh, systems, support for childcare and support for vulnerable older people and so on. Uh, but that seems to me very much what, what needs to, to be uh, done in a much greater measure uh, at the moment. Um, the uh, COVID issues do compound problems and uh, May and I were reflecting beforehand how many of our problems may be un Un unknown until they happened and happen and should uh, should that uh, the, the radioisotopes not come in except in a big batch 
by plane for our cancer patients? How will an NHS organize itself to, um, to, to manage lots of cancer patients in one go uh, when um, they're trying to manage with social distancing, even in the care situations? And there may be many other examples in pharmaceuticals, in healthcare equipment, uh, and so on, where we won't know we've got a problem until, in fact, we have. Um, I think um, the children's uh, protection issues, as May has suggested, again, extremely important, uh, uh, both as a lever for us in protecting uh, children in, in relation to uh, uh, Brexit and relation to COVID and so on. Uh, and we need to be much more active in the whole arena of ch uh, children's safeguarding uh, and, and the wider health uh, requirements that we have for our our young people. Um, in the longer term, I think uh, we do have to revisit questions of, uh, we can buy into things like European institutions, ECDC, uh, uh, the drugs monitoring service in Lisbon, which we're a major contributor to, uh, European Environment Agency, um, and uh, dare I say, the European Drugs uh, Agency as well, uh, Medicines Agency. Um, and we do need to argue uh, for our continuing involvement with uh, European colleagues. Uh, and I'm grateful to all of those of you who've been on the, uh, on the Zoom today. Uh, finally, I should say that uh, we, we didn't, weren't able to get the uh, Road Haulage Association or the Police Federation uh, or the Emergency Planning Association uh, along with this event. Um, and not for want of trying and not for their lack of willingness, I should say. Um, the Road Haulage Association have just found themselves to be very overwhelmed by the problems that they face. Uh, and like with COVID uh, and the health workforce who find themselves on the front line, uh, our lorry drivers turn out to be now perhaps a new front line for uh, a crash out Brexit. And uh, we have to depersonalize our differences with different sectors of the community that perhaps uh, we may not have had uh, alliances with in the future. And I was very heartened by the exchange that I had with the Road Haulage Association. So um, with that, um, let me just hand over now to uh, Maggie Ray uh, for a final comment. Thank you to everybody who's been on the on the Zoom. Thank you to all the staff at the faculty who've helped me uh, to organize this and uh, making it such a success. We've had over uh, 230 people actually did join us. Uh, and uh, thank you to all of you. Maggie, last word. Thank you so much, John. And um, a very, very big thank you to um, Gary, me, um, Tamara, Tammy and Tim Lang for a really outstanding presentations and obviously to Patrick for joining to help with the questions and John you've chaired this extremely well. So thank you everyone. It's been great we've got such a fantastic turnout. I did want to make a shout out to Kristen Bash, our chair of the food sick at the faculty. Um, Kristen's doing a fantastic job with our colleagues and, and many of you, Tim and others, have helped her. But it's wonderful to see one of our young leaders in public health really leading on this challenge. And uh, Tim, you've always inspired me. You probably don't remember many train journeys that we've, um, we've had when you used to visit us in the Southwest. But today, you've really made me realize that our fight, colleagues, is just beginning. And actually, we probably didn't realize that the last 20 years haven't been the most difficult years for us. The next 20 years may be the most difficult where we've got to fight even harder. But Tim, you have given us a vision today that we could, the UK could be the leading light in this agenda if we put our minds to it. And if we had um, support, you, as you say, it's unlikely we'll get it from the government, government but I see we've got to take that on as a challenge. You know, we've really got to work together, pull together on this and see what we can achieve. And it's wonderful that we do have people like Marcus. I'm absolutely certain Mar Marcus will be acknowledged in the faculty awards this year. 
and many people have spoken to me about his courage, his determination, but all of you here today that have spoken have given us a vision and I think we will work with you. We've got this huge number of people on the call today. So there's many of us that are interested. And thank you so much for uh, laying out this, uh, this agenda today and actually inspiring us to do more. And that's really the message we've got to take away from today. Let's work on this. Let's try and make it better. And perhaps this is the legacy that we can, um, we can leave into the future. Uh, it's going to be a hard fight, but let's take up the challenge and let's follow on from today's meeting. So thank you so much, John and colleagues for joining us today. And thank you everyone who's been listening online. And we will feature this in our next faculty e-bulletin. So thank you so much colleagues and uh, wish you a very good evening. Thank you. Thank you, Maggie.